you. Um, wow, what a great morning so far. How good is God? His presence uh, is so potent and tangible. I was listening to um, a wonderful preacher, fiery evangelist the other day. I, I love him. I've followed him my whole life. Um, he's with Jesus now, but uh, his name is Pastor Reinhard Bonnke. And um, he was talking about moving in the Spirit. And um, he was saying that, you know, because if, if you don't know him, you just need to Google him. He's like literally evangelized the country of Africa and saw over 22 million people, I think, and counting, saved, saved, like filled out cards and responded. Like he would have a million salvations in one service. This man had the anointing of God. He carried the fire of the Holy Spirit. And he, he said, you know, it astounds me how I can be in a service and the Holy Spirit can be moving in realms of power and I can see people being set free, delivered, healed, set on fire. And then there'll be people just stationed where they're just standing with their hands folded. And he said to the Lord, what is this? Why isn't everybody on fire? Why isn't everybody responding with the power of God? And he said, I felt the Lord say that some are flammable and some are fireproof. And he says, and the ones that are fireproof are like asbestos. <laughs> and I thought, what a brilliant analogy. Fireproof and deadly. Fireproof. When nothing, you could be in a burning home, but that asbestos isn't gonna be flammable. But I pray that we would be a church, that we would be a church that when the Spirit of God moves, that we wouldn't be like boards of asbestos where the fire ricochets off of us, but that we would choose to be pillars that would be set on fire so that we can go out in the world and be carriers of the fire of God. Because I don't know about you, but in that transition where Pastor Paul just said, there are so many of you at your wit's end, you're at the last rope. And I just saw so many as the camera panned over you, weeping in desperation. There are so many of you that need a move of God in your life. And it just again reminds me, we cannot do this without the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this life by being a good Christian. We cannot do this life by just knowing the Word of God, but we need the fire of God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit that changes things. We need to be set on fire. And I'm just so grateful for a God that said, it is so much better that I go because my limitation of being in this body cannot actually go to the ends of the earth, but that I will send my Holy Spirit so that He can live in each and every one of you. And then you can be transformed. And because of you, because of what the Holy Spirit does in us, then we can transform. We can be the, the conduits to bring the power and the presence of Jesus to a broken, dying, desperate world. Our world is crying out right now. I wanna pray before I preach. If you've watched the news, you've seen what took place in Memphis over the last few days. I wanna pray for the family of Tyree Nichols and for the people that have been affected. And I, I don't know about you, but you know, since 2020 especially is when something awakened in Pastor Henry and I of feeling what our brothers and sisters feel when things like this happen. And I was so devastated to know that over the years, things have just been overlooked or just brushed or not talked about because people are too scared or people are worried what other people are gonna think. But you know what I've learned is that when one hurts, we all hurt. 
And when one's broken, we get broken. And when one is hurting, that we need to come alongside our brothers and sisters. And I'll never forget, 2020 changed my life for the better. 2020, I got to actually see firsthand because I don't understand. I will never understand what it is like As a white Australian woman who has come to this country, I didn't understand until I sat one day after so many events had happened and I'm with prominent female leaders on a Zoom. Women that you would know, you've heard them preach, household names in the Christian movement, affluent women articulate women, intelligent women, weeping on that Zoom because they were concerned for their sons. And that's when it hit me. It hit me that I will never understand what it's like. And so when this happens this week, we have a beautiful community of colour that is hurting with those that are hurting. And as us as a family, we need to come alongside and we need to pray. Because humanity is broken right now and there is evil and people are mean and people are cruel. And that is not how God designed us to be. We are image bearers and He made us unique and He made us diverse and He made us beautiful. He made us in the image, all the colours, all the shapes, all the sizes. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I want us to pray for those families. I want us to pray for Memphis. I want us to pray for our communities. I want us to pray that Jesus would come on earth as it is in heaven and annihilate hatred and sin like never before. And I don't know about you church, but we need to be praying. We need to be praying and sitting in those places and standing in the gap, praying that God would arrest hearts that are evil, that God would arrest lives that are so filled with hatred and anger and power and whatever it is. But we need God to break through and bring a reformation of love like we've never seen it before. So would you just reach out your hands? Would you take a moment and ask God and cry out, God, would you send your spirit? Because we need a breakthrough. God, I pray that you would move upon this earth that we would awaken to Your love and that because we've received Your love that we would love others the way You love us. God, we stand in the gap and we pray and we humble ourselves and we cry out. God, we cry out, we turn from these wicked ways. God, we stand in on behalf of the humanity that is just not knowing You, that just doesn't depend on You, that doesn't obey You, Father God. And we ask that You would intercept. God, I pray that what the enemy meant for evil, that You would turn around for good. And God, I pray that You, by Your Holy Spirit, would comfort those that are mourning right now that You would bring peace and I just rebuke the devourer that would try and bring any fear. Because fear is the currency of the enemy, but faith is the currency of heaven. And so God, where fear tries to creep in with mothers, with their sons, wives, with their husbands, friends, uncles, brothers, whatever it is, Father God, I just rebuke the devourer that would try and come and bring fear. And that we would stand and we would know, God, that where there is darkness and where there is heaviness, God, your shine and bright light of grace and mercy is louder and clearer than ever. And though there may be dark days or all over this earth where people are being mistreated, where people are being hated on, Father God, whatever it is, God, our humanity is groaning. And I pray for the sons and daughters to rise up and be the vessels of reconciliation, be the vessels of love and be the vessels that represent Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.
men. Come on, let's give God some glory. It doesn't always feel like we wanna do that, but I'm telling you, the enemy will not win. And we will stand and we will know that it is by our love that people will know that we're His disciples. And we've got to keep showing it. And we've got to keep being it. And we've got to keep displaying it. But I'm telling you, our world will not change until Jesus changes lives. And so we have to pray that Jesus comes. And that's why church, I know I'm going to preach in a minute, but we cannot be the sleeping giant that we really are. We're a sleeping giant. I'm talking about the big C church. I get to travel a bit and I, I'm concerned if I have to be really honest. Because this is not church. This is where we come to corporately come together to be edified, to be built up, to be equipped. But you are the church. And we need to be the church out of these four walls. This is not what I live for. This is 1% of my life. This is so beautiful because this is where I begin to just grow and I get that, oh, we can face the week. But I'm telling you, if you are not praying and interceding and loving and being Jesus Monday through Saturday, what on earth are we doing? This is so that we're equipped to go. But so many people just care about their two hour program on a Sunday. That's not the point. Because if our world is not changing out there, then this is useless. And so, Father, arrest us. Speak to us. Oh, I couldn't, I didn't even know I was going to preach this word in relation to this. But God, this is where it's at, God. God, I pray that as this word is out, coming out of my mouth, God, it is your word, your word that's alive, active, sharper than any double edged sword, that it has the ability to penetrate and divide between soul, spirit, joint, and marrow. And it judges the attitudes of our heart. So, God, I pray wherever we are at right now, by Your Holy Spirit, would You speak to us? Would You chasten us? Would You inspire us? Would You give revelation to us that while we are here on earth, that we are called to bring to earth that which is in heaven. And so God, I pray that we would go from this place today changed from the inside out so that we can go be the church and see lives transformed. In the name of Jesus, anoint this Word in Jesus' Name. Amen. Sit down. Okay. I am pretty pumped about this because I'm very, very, very passionate. I do really want you to come next week, especially um, because Pastor Henry really does have a word on his heart for 2023. And I, I'm more passionate about the church being the church and building the church. But that doesn't mean building service. I'll say that again. We're here to build the church, not build service. And the church needs to be bigger than where the world's at right now and the world's dominating and, 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 and we need to be the dominators because that's actually our mandate. You know, when the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, I love that the prayer he taught them was, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He was teaching the disciples to pray that God's will would be on earth as it is in heaven. Not our will, not our ways, but He said, pray this way. Pray this way because I need you to continue this journey, this mission of bringing heaven to earth. Jesus did that. Jesus came 2,000 years ago and He did the will of the Father.
He didn't do anything. I was saying this to somebody the other day. He didn't come on earth and start Jesus Christ Ministries. We've got so many ministries, but are we preaching the Gospel? Because the perfect will of the Father is that all mankind would be saved. If you wanna know what the perfect will of God is, is that everyone would be saved. God's will for Jesus to come on earth was to destroy the works of the evil one. And He did that. He accomplished that at the cross and therefore the enemy has been defeated. Yet we, some of us still walk around like the enemy has more power over us. The enemy has no power. He only, you only give him the power that he has over you. You give him access to the power in your life. But we have great power and great authority. And because Jesus obeyed the Father, He says at the last command, the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, He says, Now all authority has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I have taught you to obey, and lo, I will be with you always. All authority has been given to me. Why was all authority given to Jesus? All authority was given to Jesus because Jesus had full obedience. And I wanna propose to you today, I think the reason why the church is lame, I'm gonna use that word, to a certain degree, it's lame, it's sick, it's, it's not fully functional. I'm not talking lame like, oh, that's lame. I'm talking it's lame, it's, there's, it's crippled. It's not fully functioning. It's because we're not being fully obedient. We're disobedient. And I'm gonna show you today how it's our obedience that actually increases and gives us greater authority and it's disobedience that diminishes our authority. There is a lot of popular people on this earth right now and there's a lot of influential people, but that doesn't give them authority. There's a lot of churches out there doing good programs, good things, but there's no power to break shackles, chains and see deliverance. And right now we're living in a world where we're almost walking as Christians, but we're denying the power thereof of that which is inside of us because of disobedience. And yet Jesus has all authority because He was fully obedient. We lost our authority because of disobedience. And so I wanna take us on this journey. Psalm chapter eight, verse four says this, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you have made Him a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honour. You gave them charge over everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds and the sky, the fish and the sea and everything that swims, the ocean currents. Oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Do you realise the psalmist here is quoting Genesis? They're quoting Genesis 126 of when God said, I've made you in my image, male and female, I have made you. And I have given you all dominion and authority and power to rule the earth, to subdue it. That you will have authority over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the livestock and every plant. Go and work and go and subdue the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. This is yours. You have dominion. You have authority over the earth. Now go be the image bearers that I've called you to be and that I've designed you to be. It was set. It was done and yet it was their disobedience that caused them to lose their authority in the garden. And because they disobeyed the simple instruction to not eat from one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, one tree. Now when God gives you an instruction, it is not to kill your joy. It is not to remove you from having fun. It's not to not bless you. It's actually to protect you. But humanity, when you have a wrong understanding of the nature of your Father, you will not trust His instruction. 
And the enemy came in with doubt to say, your God isn't who He says He is. He's holding out on you. And therefore, if you eat of this tree, you'll gain something that He doesn't want you to have. And the enemy's been doing that since the beginning of time, lying to us, saying, God's not who He says He is. And you need to have that in your life. You need to have that relationship. You need to have that money. You need to have that because that will make you this or that will make... And God says, I actually know what's best for you because I created you. But when we don't trust that our Father fully loves us and that we are fully accepted by Him, we will not obey His instruction because it's out of love and dependence. You see, the whole point of the garden of the knowledge of good and evil to be put there was so that humanity would continually depend on the Father's instruction. But what they did is they became independent and did their own way thinking they knew better. And that is the problem with the church right now. We think we know better. We think we know better than God's instruction. We think we know better than the Word of God. We think we can devour the Scriptures. But you know what I've really learned the older that I'm getting? I just want to obey two things. I I, I want to boil this whole book down to two things. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul and all your strength. And love others like yourself. Could you imagine if the church, the global church, had just obeyed the two instructions that Jesus actually said are the greatest? He boiled everything down. The Old Testament. And he's like, you know what? Actually, the apostles and the prophets, they hang on these two things. This is how the church is actually going to function. The church is going to function on love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love others. Because if you love God and you understand His love, you will not be able to hate anyone. You can't. You can't keep an offence with anybody. You can't actually hold grudges against anyone. Could you imagine if Christians, let's just talk about Christians. Forget the world. They don't know any better. If Christians actually obeyed those two instructions. Ouch. See, I think obedience is the key to gaining authority. Because Adam and Eve lost their authority in the garden through disobedience. And Jesus had to restore authority through obedience. I know this because Romans 5 verse 19 says it. For as through one man's disobedience... The many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Our acceptance that was fully ours got replaced by rejection and separation. Our innocence was replaced by guilt and shame. Our authority was replaced by weakness and insecurity. Our dominion was replaced by fear and insignificance. And now the flesh dictates that which the spirit needs to dominate. But as new creations in Christ church, we don't have the old man anymore. And yet we're still contending with the old man. And we're still wrestling with the old man. We're still literally dancing with the flesh, when God says that no longer exists, when you got baptised, it was a symbolic moment of you getting up out of that water and saying, that person is dead and this person is alive and now I am a slave to Jesus and He is my Lord. And there's no such thing. Joyce Meyer says this, you can't say no Lord in one sentence. It's the only two words that don't go together. No Lord. Because if Jesus is your Lord, like hope was sharing, then it's yes, always. So could you imagine if the church just obeyed the whisper or just obeyed the simple thing that He's asking you to do, how your life would change through obedience. And this is why Jesus had to come on this earth so that He could show us, church, You see, he hasn't told us what to do and says, do as I say, not as I do. He said, let me show you how it's done. And I'm going to come in man form. And I'm going to be fully God, yet I'm going to be fully man. And I'm going to actually walk with the same limitations that you have. I will have a body. I will have five senses. 
I will be tempted like you will be tempted. I will suffer. Do you know the Scripture actually says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering? Did you know that? We just think God was automatically obedient. Oh, because He's God, so He's automatically obedient. No, no, He learned obedience through suffering. In Luke 2.52, it says He grew in stature and in favour with God and man. He grew into it. He did it by all those little obediences along the way and this is how Jesus became. And He's showing us that when you're that tethered to your relationship with the Father, it's doable. It's actually doable. And I know this because, and I don't want to embarrass my son Taylor right now because I know he's sitting with all his youth friends, but... But I just know this. My son has, and you know, in anyone that's known him from childhood, like there's just something in him that always wants to be obedient. Even his teachers would say, he just always wants to do the right thing. There's been something innate in him from birth that says, I don't want to displease my mum and my dad. I, I, I want to be obedient. And I've, I've watched this kid over and over and over and he's really just such a joy to me, Henry, because we're like, this kid just lives to obey. Now he's not perfect. Where are you? I can't even see you. Oh, he's hiding. <laughs> He, he's not perfect, but I'm telling you, there's an obedience because you know what? He actually loves me and Henry. And he doesn't want to disappoint us because he doesn't want to break our hearts. And do you know if that, if you want to know what the definition of the fear of the Lord is, that's actually it. It's not being afraid. It's actually, I don't want to disappoint God. I don't want to break his heart by disobeying. I, I want to do what pleases him to bring honour to his name. You know, I remember Taylor one day just saying something funny to his sister and she, she, was, she came downstairs with something or whatever and he goes, and just in a jokey way, he says, hey, you, don't, you just don't want to bring dishonour to the silly name. <laughs> and I thought it was so cute. We all laughed and, and whatever. But you know what? That's, that's how we should be with the Lord. I don't want to bring dishonour to the name that represents my Jesus, my Lord. I don't want to bring dishonour. I want the world to see that my Father is awesome. And that He is true and that He is good and it comes through obedience. And when you are obedient, there is blessing on your life. It's actually a supernatural realm you get to tap into. And I'm amazed, you know, you look at life of disobedience, of lawlessness and how it's full of chaos. I look at marriages that just will not submit to one another because they're so stubborn and they so want to do it their way. And you wonder why you've got chaos in your households. Because obedience is being submitted to the Father first. Husbands, love your wives as Christ laid down His life for the church, which means unto death. And then you won't have any trouble with your wife submitting to you. But a lot of you men want your wives to submit without you laying down your lives. It doesn't work that way. Obedience. You see, I'm first obedient to my father. That's what makes me submitted to my husband. It's because I love him and he loves me that I want to honour him through my marriage. And I look at my marriage not as just someone I get to live with for the rest of my life, but I look at my marriage as a display of the mystery of the covenant between God and his church. And so I don't want my marriage on earth to show anything but the mystery of covenant. So that when the world, you know, I was actually at um, my esthetician the other day. Funny story. And I was telling her about something that Henry had told me and we were just laughing and talking about this. And then she literally stops me and she goes, oh, is this your second marriage? I said, what? What? She goes, oh, is this your second marriage? Because you just are talking like you're still on your honeymoon. I said, girl, I've been married nearly 25 years to the same man. And yes, we still are on our honeymoon. <laughs> because it can be done. And she went, where did you meet him? I said, in church. I said, but be careful. They're not all like him. 
Just because you go to church doesn't make you anything like Henry. Thank you. (laughs) But what I love about Henry is that he loves his father and his father's taught him how to love me and vice versa. And so we have this beautiful unified marriage that displays the glory and splendor. See, it's obedience. It's obedience. It's not doing what the world says. It's doing what God says. I've gone way off track and none of this was in the nine o'clock service. (laughs) Thanks, Pastor Phil. You know, Jesus had to come and he had to make right what we got wrong in the garden. And it was in the garden in the most perfect environment that we didn't do it right. Adam, in the most perfect environment, of environments still got it wrong. And yet Jesus comes and in the hardest environment, he does it right. And the difference is I believe that his knowledge of sonship was all the difference. His understanding of sonship. His understanding that his father is good all the time and therefore whatever he asks of me, I know it's for my good and for the good of the people around me. And therefore, as he grew in obedience through suffering, God takes him to the journey. Now he's 30 years of age and he gets baptised in water and the whole of the people that are around him, surround him, get to hear the audible voice of the Father saying, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove and it's from that moment that he's anointed for service. But he doesn't just go out and start Jesus Christ ministries, he actually gets led into the wilderness and not in the garden where it was perfect, where he had everything. He was fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And this is why church, when when we tell you to fast and pray, we're not making you suffer for nothing, but there is something that you get to gain on the other side of denying yourself of your fleshly desires and wants because you gain an authority on the other side. Because if you can't put down that Twizzler for a week, you ain't gonna be putting down that app. There's an authority that God's wanting to develop inside of you. It's a discipline, not because He wants to kill your joy, but He wants to make you a sharp arrow. He's wanting to refine you and make you better than the world. And He says, in order to do that, I need you to be obedient. And so Jesus goes into the wilderness and the enemy comes to tempt Him of His sonship. That word temptation is not to seduce to sin. It means, it's parasmos, it means to test and prove by trial. So Jesus wasn't going into the wilderness to be seduced to sin. It was so that He could be proven by trial and testing to gain authority. And so He does. And the enemy comes and says, if you are the Son of God, is the enemy's literally, the, he plays the same game. He's just been told he's the Son of God. The whole earth just heard it audibly. And he's like, if you are, prove it. You're starving, right? Now make these rocks turn into bread. And he says, hey, listen, it is written, man doesn't need to live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When God says it's time to eat, I'll eat, because for now I'm doing his will and I'm doing it his way. And I will not feed myself I'll let him come and minister to me when the time is right. And then the enemy comes again. He says, hey, throw yourself up the top of this mountain and let's see. Because Scripture does say that if you were to do this, that, you know, your heel won't be bruised and you'll be protected and a legion of angels will come. And he's like, yeah, it's actually also written not to test the Lord your God. I love that enemy will also use Scripture to test and twist you. Because he's actually clever. He's not stupid. He actually did reside in heaven one day. So he knows better than you, actually. And do you know what else he knows? He knows your authority that you don't even know you have. Because he's really ticked that you were made in the image of God and he wasn't. Ha! He knows your authority more than you do. And that's why he tempts you to sin 
Because if he can get you believing less than of yourself, then you don't have authority or power over him, which was what was God's design all along. And so he says, excuse me, don't test the Lord your God. Let me just remind you, he's not saying it, this is Alex's version. I'm God, you're not, shut up. So he comes again, third time. Oh, now I'll take you to everything. Look, look at all the kingdoms. I can give them to you. And he had every right to give them to him because you know what? Adam and Eve forfeited their authority and gave them straight to the enemy. And so he could have. He could have right then and then. And we we look at that and we probably don't understand the full ramifications of that. But right there, what the enemy was saying, if you bow down and worship me, you can shortcut your going to the cross. And you can actually get rid of sickness right now and you can get rid of abuse and you can get rid of calamity and you can get rid of every blind eye and every sick... Like you can have all the things. You can have it all. You can have authority. But it will only be limited to here and it will not be eternal. And so Jesus is like, you know what? That may all be good, but that's half obedience and that's half authority. I want full authority. But so many of us will stop just short of our breakthrough to gain full authority because that immediate gratification looks so good when we're so weak and God's like, uh, no, this ain't gonna happen. And so he turns to him and he says, listen, I'm gonna tell you it again. It is written that I will not worship anybody other than my father. And now go. And Satan had to flee. And it says that when Jesus left the wilderness, that he was full of the power of the Spirit. Full. He was at a hundred. He was full of authority, full of power because he overcame. He proved the enemy that he was God's son and he wasn't gonna disobey for anything. And he knew that the other side of his obedience was gonna be your salvation. And so he says, no, 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 no. I will not do what suits me right now for the sake of my own benefit, but I'm doing this for you. And so if you don't understand how much Jesus loves you in this place, please understand that He loves you more than anything that He was willing to go to death so that He could finish the work, so that you could have full authority. And He did this, it was new and it was amazing and He did it in a full obedience. And in Philippians chapter two, verse six, it says, He existed in the form of God. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Guys, do we understand? I learned this scripture when I was 21 years of age and it has just never left me. It's the humility of the living. This is why I, I have to constantly bow to this. Because we are nothing without Jesus. And if He's everything, the creator of the universe, He created you, He made you, yet He chooses to come and be just as menial as humanity. He says, I consider it not to be equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but I'm actually gonna humble myself in the appearance of a man. Isaiah says that he wasn't even attractive, that people would pass him by because they couldn't even look at him. The way the Western world paints Jesus, he was not attractive. Because you know why? He wanted to see, are people gonna see me for me or for what the outside says? He was willing to be disregarded, overlooked. And he made himself nothing. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, guys, for this reason, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed him on him the name which is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Are you listening? That means all authority is His. Nothing is above Him. Nothing, no sickness, no title, no queen, no throne, no king, no empire. Nothing is above Him because of His full obedience. 
that he chose to go to the cross for you and I. And so now he has full authority. And then in Matthew, he says, now all authority has been given to me and now I give it to you. Do you understand the authority that you have? But most of us are still stuck in, does Jesus love me? Am I worthy enough? Am I good enough? Am I called? What's my purpose? Your purpose is to do the will of the Father. Your purpose is to see souls saved. The greatest purpose in life, see, America and most of the Western world loves to fulfill dreams. And we've really, we've really romanticized that God's here to fulfill our dreams. But the greatest dream is to know him and be known by him. The greatest dream is to live a life devoted. Jacob, if you could come. The greatest dream is that you would be loved and seen by God. Because you know that scripture that says, not all that call me Lord, Lord will come in. Oh, but I did this in your name and I prophesied in your name and I raised the dead in your name and I saw that demonic spirit delivered in your name. Well, of course, because it wasn't you that did it. It was Jesus who did it. We can do a lot of things in the name of Jesus. But he'll say, hey, depart from me because I never knew you. Wow. See, I want to be known by Jesus. I I want him to know that we're friends. No, I'm a woman after his heart because I'm willing to obey him. You see, Saul was a great king, but he was rejected as king because he was disobedient. And, and Samuel says, hey, you've disobeyed God. He just asked you to do one simple assignment, but you had to do it your way. And you even acted spiritual about it and you, you sacrificed the animals that he told you to kill. And because of your disobedience, you're no longer king. But I've chosen a man, a young man, a man after my own heart. And the reason why he's a man after my own heart, it says it in Acts that God testified of David because he was a man after my own heart, because he will do what I ask him to do. And David wasn't perfect, but David knew His place that He is God and He is not. And He knew how to repent. And He knew that relationship with God was more important than victories won and kingdoms subdued. He said, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, renew a right spirit within me. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't cast me from your presence. But grant me a willing spirit that will sustain me a willing spirit that will be surrendered and devoted to be obedient to You. Could you imagine if we were just obedient when the whispers, how many times a week do you get the whispers to go pray for that person and you don't because you're afraid? Ordinary unschooled men that had been with Jesus did extraordinary things because they were just obedient. Jesus did extraordinary things because when God said, move here and go to that and go across over here and go to the other side and go heal the sick there and and, and go to Samaria today. Samaria, why are we going to Samaria? We're going to Samaria. That's odd, we're not supposed to mix with the Samaria. We're going to Samaria because there's some work for me to do there. You see, how many of us won't go to places when you've been prompted and you've seen and you're always going to rationalise, well, I can't go there because that doesn't feel safe and that doesn't do that. And and we forfeit the glory of God being revealed because of our disobedience and we wonder why we have no authority. God's not looking for popular and influential. He's really sick of it. He's sick of influences. <laughs> There's tons of them. Influencing this and influencing that. It's not influence 
that we need. It's authority. It's power. It's dominion. It's the power that moves through us. There's a dying world out there that needs the power of God in us. But could you imagine if you were just obedient? I finished with this little story. And again, the 9am got a very different message. You know, when I got saved, I love that Paul talked about that first love and to go back to do what you did at first. Because when I got saved, I was only 11 years of age. I will never forget it. I'll never forget the day that I got saved and I walked down a really big middle aisle of a church of about 4,000 people in Adelaide, South Australia. Pastor Andrew was speaking a message, just pure gospel. I'd never heard the gospel before. I'd been in church since I was a baby, but this was the first week that I'd been invited to this church that would later be my home until we moved. But it was that morning, that night actually, it was 5 p.m. service. I got saved and when I came to the front, I felt the love of God like I've never felt before in my life. And I was only 11. And you couldn't wipe the smile from my face. I had a radical encounter with Jesus. And the week later, I went back to the little Italian church that my parents were part of. And the pastor didn't know what to do with me because I ran right up the front at the end and I said, I want the Holy Spirit. And he wasn't preaching on the Holy Spirit. I don't even know what he was preaching on because it was fully in Italian. And I would have checked out as an 11 year old kid. But I was hungry for the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came on me. No one prayed for me. I just was hungry and I began to speak in my heavenly language. Guys, I was set on fire. I would go to school and I would witness to the teachers, to the priests, to the nuns. I went to a Catholic private school. I had no fear. I wasn't in arguments. I wasn't in debates. I was just telling them the goodness of God. I remember laying, I had my cousin over once and she wasn't a believer and she was riddled with night terrors and I would begin to speak over, over her, her, her spirit and it would calm her. And I began to see the gifts of the Spirit at work. I would be on my school bus and the Lord would say, that girl needs a word of encouragement. And I'd be like, oh, I don't know what that means. And He said, go tell her this and go ask her that. And I, I didn't even know I was moving in the gifts of the Spirit as a young age. I was so in love with Jesus that all I did was wanted to tell people about Jesus. And because of that, every single time, I just became obedient, obedient, obedient. I'm still like that to this day, guys. If I'm on an aeroplane and somebody is sitting next to me, God will tell me something and I will obey. And there are days where I haven't been obedient and then something happens and I'm going, you know what? The Lord actually told me to do that and I didn't do it. And some things could have changed if I'd just been obedient, but I was so caught up in my own busyness and in my own junk that I didn't obey because I rationalised it out. But I'm telling you guys that when you get a hold of the love of God as your Father and that His assignments for you are not only for you, but they're also for the salvation of people, the trajectory of your Christian life will change. Teenagers, Christianity will not be boring. You will not be wanting to get uh, drunk on alcohol. You won't be wanting to take drugs. You won't want sex. Sex is secondary to an encounter with God. You all think that this promiscuous lifestyle is so cool, wonderful. It robs you of your authority because you actually haven't tasted of what God has for you and what He's got for you is better than any drug. It's better than any orgasm that you will ever have. And I wanna talk real today because we go for the junk when God wants to give us the best. We go for what we think is good and God's going, if you would just be obedient. I stayed pure till I got married and I was the weird girl. Everyone made fun of me because I was still pure when I got married. Oh, but I'm telling you 25 years into my marriage, it's awesome because I don't have the baggage 
I don't have the memories. I don't have the the issues that other people have. And we think that because we're going to follow the world, that we do it this way. We're not cool. We're not that. I'm telling you, it gains an authority so that when I get to speak into relationships and marriages, there's an authority. You see, God's saying, I don't want to remove things from you so that you don't live a blessed life. I'm actually protecting you. There's some of you that you're settling for spouses that don't follow Jesus because you think God can't provide the right one for you. And you're being disobedient by swiping those swipes and finding some guy who will take you out on a date. But make no mistake, you can't build a life on somebody who doesn't love Jesus. Yeah. That's a word for somebody today. God's saying, I've given you all authority. Now go and make disciples. See, that's not, sometimes I think we think that's such a religious thing. I must make disciples. No, show them how to live a life set apart. Just live your life full of the glory of God. And I'm telling you, people will be lining up asking, where did you get that joy from? Where did you get that power from? Where did you get that discipline from? Where did you get a marriage like that? Like that girl, my esthetician, she was like, where did you find him? I said, in church. I said, there are still some good men out there. Don't settle. Don't settle for the jerks who just want everything. If he can't wait for you, he's not worth you. If he can't wait for you, if he can't honour your mother and your father, he's not worth it. He can't. Henry was willing. Even when my mum hated him, he waited. You see, obedience brings blessing. I want a church that at that first time obedience, we hear His voice, we obey. We hear His voice, we obey. We don't second guess. I, you know, I just love that Jesus, literally, he just, he just did what the Father asked Him to do. And then look at the results. Don't be afraid. Do it scared. I do it scared all the time. I do it scared all the time. When God says, hey, do this or give this or say that or pray for that. I love watching that. And then you go away elated on cloud nine because you're like, God did something. And you're like, why aren't I obedient more often? And you know, sometimes nothing has happened. But that's a seed zone. Because you're not always meant to be the closer. Sometimes you're the one that sows the seed. Sometimes you're the one that waters it. Sometimes you're the one that, you know, pulls the weed out. God's the one who produces the fruit. He's the one that grows that thing. But I'm telling you, if you could be a chink in the chain that keeps that person moving towards Jesus, I'm telling you, we're going to get to heaven and we're going to see an array of faces saying, thank you for your obedience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you. You know, this church is an act of obedience. God said, do it. I said, no. He said, what, did, what am I your Lord? I didn't want to run a church. Henry didn't want to run a church. We didn't know the first thing to do, running a church. And people don't believe that. But honestly, you're going to know me. You'll know. This was not my jam. But you see, when I've been surrendered to the Lord, He says, listen and obey. Listen and obey. And could you imagine if I had rationalised and said all the reasons why we can't have people in our basement? And trust me, there were some weird people that came to my basement. (laughs) Souls are saved. Lives have been changed. The presence of God has been unlocked. People have been delivered, set free. Obedience increases your authority. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know the Spirit of God is in this place. I know that He's been speaking to you. I know that He's been moving on your heart. This is not a word to condemn or make you feel less than. This is actually in a an equipping, it's a, it's a word to inspire and encourage to see that there's more in you. That the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. 
that you've been made a new creation, that you are seated in heavenly places, that the Father has given you access to the healing signs, wonders, miracles, to deliverance. It always amazes me that he just sent 72 disciples out and he said, hey, go, heal the sick. Pray for the, those that are demonised. Go do it. They didn't need to do a six-week course. They didn't need to go to Bible college. Ordinary unschooled men by the commissioning and the delegated authority of Jesus Christ. And He says, now go, go and do this. And I'm leaving you with the glory and I'm leaving you with the charge to make disciples and baptise nations. In the Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teach them, show them. Lead them like I've led you. And I'll be with you. I'll be with you forever. And all I ask for you to do is be obedient. And I want to ask you, church, I want to ask you watching online, I want to ask you today, I want, I want you to get right in your heart and say, God, I'm sorry for the times that I've been disobedient because I've literally just cared too much about what somebody thinks or I've been too fearful to step out or I'm looking at my own strength and not yours and I'm looking at my own flesh instead of your spirit. God, whatever the, uh, the, the questions are, some of us, it's just fear. But I'm saying, do it scared. Because <laughs> it's not about fear. Fear just paralyzes, but doing it scared. Even Joshua did it scared. Be strong and courageous. Every time an angel appeared to people, he said, fear not. It's, you know, it's there. It's real. But he says, you know, in me, you can do all things. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You could do it. Just step out. And I want you to stand to your feet when you are ready to just go, Jesus, I'm choosing to be obedient. I'm choosing to trust that You're my good Father. I'm choosing that no longer am I gonna do it my way, but I'm gonna yield my will to Your will. I'm going to do what Hope said at the beginning where Jesus, You've been my Saviour for a a long time, but You've actually not been my Lord because I still choose what I pick up and what I don't pick up because I'm still doing life my way if I have to be really honest. And guys, I'm standing up already. Because as a leader of this church, I know that there are areas of disobedience in my own life where God's asked me to step out and do some ridiculous, crazy things, but there's still a little bit of fear. And so I'm not preaching this at you, I'm preaching with you. And I'm saying, God, it's time. It's time to be like Jesus. If Jesus showed that He could do it, I can do it. And I want you to stand to your feet by saying, Jesus, I choose obedience. I choose first time obedience. Oh, I may stumble and fall along the way, but my heart posture is first time obedience. Oh, let us begin to cry out. Maybe some of us need to repent before Jesus and just say, God, I'm just so sorry. I've been sorry about the fear. I'm sorry about the, just the, the, what would, what would people think? What are people gonna say? I'm sorry that I didn't even have enough faith to maybe think if something isn't gonna change on the other side of my obedience, but that's not what you're after. You're just after obedience. Because obedience is so much better than sacrifice. Obedience, whether something changes or not, is so much better than having to go over and over and over and above to prove to God that you love Him. He knows you love Him. But all that we would do the things that we did at first because of our first love. That we would go back to that moment when Jesus wrecked our lives and we couldn't help but tell people about Jesus. We couldn't help but lead others to church. We couldn't help but bring everybody we knew. We couldn't help but pray for somebody at the airport or in the public's queue. We, 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 we wanted to pay for people and we didn't second guess. We just chose to do it because we knew you were asking us to do it. And God, I pray right now that you would just give courage and boldness by your Holy Spirit. In fact, raise your hands right now because it's the courage and boldness that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit, that dunamis power. It's why Jesus said to His disciples, don't you dare go anywhere and leave Jerusalem until the power of of the Spirit is clothing you from on high. He knew they couldn't do this in their flesh. And I think so many of us are trying to do the walk of faith in our own flesh. And He says, no, let the power of the Holy Spirit baptise you. In fact, let it baptise you right now. Ask Him, say, would you 
just pour out your spirit so that I would be bold as a lion, that I would be courageous, that there would be a power that flows out of me, that I would be flammable rather than fireproof. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you come down now? Would you come? Would you come? Would you come in waves? Would you come as we have repented and we have yielded to your Lordship and said, God, let your will be done, not mine. God, I pray that what will come of this week and the weeks to come will be such beautiful fruit. God, I pray that the church would come alive. The church would realise their position. The church would realise that it's not about the two hours on Sunday, but it's all about every single day, Monday, to Saturday about being the church and being on mission and being on assignment and listening and obeying and seeing lives change. But our faith grows in the meantime. And God, I pray that You would ignite a fire in Your people. Come on, if you've got your spirit language, begin to pray in the Spirit. Begin to pray in the Spirit. Begin to pray in the Spirit.